All right. Let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, thank you all so much for taking time out of your Tuesday evening to join us for this Fire Smart Landscaping webinar. Um, you know, as we've been talking in the chat, for those of us here in Sonoma and Napa County, this is a particularly pertinent topic at this time and our hearts go out to our friends, family, neighbors who are under evacuation orders. And also for those of us who aren't but are feeling that stress and anxiety um, that these kind of events bring up. So uh, no pressure, but if you feel inclined, um, I wanna invite you to just take a deep breath with me before we launch into talking about things we can do to, to manage our risks from these exact kinds of events. So I'm just gonna Deep breath in, deep breath out. All right, so my name is Connor Devane. I am a programs coordinator with Daily Acts. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by us, Daily Acts, and it's made possible by our partners at the town of Windsor. So uh, very grateful to the folks in Windsor making this a possibility. For those of you who may not know about Daily Acts, I just want to take a minute or two to, to talk about who we are, a little bit about what we do. We're based in Petaluma. Um, Daily Acts is a holistic education nonprofit that takes a heart-centered approach to inspiring transformative actions that create a connected, equitable, and climate resilient communities. We believe in the power of our daily actions to reconnect people to self, uh, to community and to place, which in turn help to heal our society and our planet. Um, we have sort of a three-pronged approach to do this. So that holistic approach starts in the soil and swells into culture and policy change. So first we spread solutions and models to offer people the skills and tools to conserve resources while they're growing food, medicine, habitat, and community. And because change happens through mindful collaborations, we also invest in strengthening community leadership by equipping leaders who um, like understand the interrelations of social, economic, and environmental justice issues through our networks, alliances, and leadership programs like the North Bay Environmental Health Network, our Leadership Institute for Just and Resilient Communities, and our newly adopted youth program, Eco to School, which we're really excited about. These efforts all consolidate into building public and political will by mobilizing our community's power towards environmental and climate justice policies. So over the past 18 years, the impacts that we and our community have made are broad and diverse, uh, but just at a glance, we've hosted over 1400 programs and have inspired you know, dozens of, or put in like dozens of demonstration gardens for fire survivors, shelterless veterans, and schools, just to name a couple things. Um, so that's a little bit about daily acts. Um, but now I have the honor of introducing our special guests and panelists, Ann Baker and Damian McAnany. So Ann Baker is principal and owner of Ann Baker Landscape Architecture based in Petaluma. Anne specializes in the ecological design of natural and sustainable landscapes with a focus on connecting cultural values with landscape design and care. Anne's recent work includes leading the team, creating the rebuild landscape templates for the Sonoma Water Agency after the 2017 Tubbs fire, as well as the four acre wild garden for the Grace Hudson Museum in Ukiah. Anne's currently a board member of Taking Action for Living Systems, working to establish an innovative ecosystem services and regenerative, ener excuse me, regenerative enterprise-based approach to uh, reduce wildfire hazards, increase climate change resilience, and improve forest health in California's North Bay. She's the current chair of the Petaluma Climate Action Commission. Um, she has an AB degree from Harvard and a master's in landscape architecture from UC Berkeley and has been a licensed landscape architect since 2003. Welcome, Anne. So grateful to have you here. Excited to learn from you. Damien is the design director for Permaculture Artisans. He's thrilled to be in a position where he can influence the design of landscapes to be more in harmony with how nature works. 
He's been in the landscaping field since 2006, holding positions in ecological restoration, landscape maintenance and construction, arboriculture, project management, estimating and ecological design. He's an ISA certified arborist and an accredited professional with the Sustainable Sites Initiative of the US Green Building Council, which is basically lead for landscapes. He's a permaculture teacher and has worked with Jeff Lawton's Greening the Desert Project in Jordan, uh, which if you don't know about, you should definitely look up, it's really cool. Welcome, Damien. Likewise, so grateful to have you with us tonight. Um, so without any further, well, really quick, just a couple tips, norms. We're gonna be having presentations from each, Anne and Damien, and then we're gonna have a long Q&A, so you'll have plenty of time to ask questions that you either came with tonight or that occurred to you throughout the presentation. So you're welcome to ask these at any time using the Q&A function or the chat function. Um, but for the most part, we're gonna be saving these questions for that Q&A um, portion of the event. So without any further ado, I'm happy to pass it over to Anne to, to get us started. Thank you, Connor. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Um, Hope everyone's staying safe and well tonight. Um, let's see, I'm gonna start this up. So um, my name's Ann Baker and I have a small farm in Petaluma. Doing a presentation kind of shared with Damien on fire sm smart landscapes. And um, we're gonna kind of do an inside out game. I'm gonna do the closer to the house part and he's gonna do the further from the home part. And I. Probably don't need to spend any time on this, but we're, we're kind of all getting familiar with the fact that we live in a, a high fire, fire severity zone. Um, the yellow is actually moderate fire danger. The orange is, um, is high and the red is very high. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find my little zoom scribbly thing. So there they are. Um, <clears throat> oops, now I'm going too far. Anyway, um, we are in a climate-induced uh, series of changes in our landscape that's causing it to be more fire-prone. And so this is a really timely conversation, how we can adapt to our landscape uh, that does need to burn periodically to renew itself and how we can protect ourselves. So we'll go into uh, a lot of detail here. So this is a, a, just a brief thing from the California Building Code. The California Building Code since 2018 and even before has been adapting more and more stringent rules around building in uh, fire prone areas or also known as wild, uh, wildland interface, urban interface areas. And there's two major components. There's vegetation management and building components. So we're gonna focus mostly on the vegetation management, but I'm gonna run through the building components right in the beginning because the first most important thing to do is to get your home hardened. So there's a whole list of things from the roof, gutters, vents, siding, windows, and decking that all need to be addressed. <clears throat> so our fire smart guidelines that we're gonna articulate in this conversation are to start with the house and work outward and develop a non-combustible zone for the first five feet. And then sending out from there 30 feet, look at a clean, clean and green landscape and then we'll talk about this more in detail, but you're gonna maintain the canopy and, of trees and shrubs 10 feet or more away from each other and away from structures. You wanna have um, good sight lines and visibility and access for firefighters and other safety personnel. We'll briefly go over fire safer plant selection and um, how you reduce the connectivity of fuels. And our overall objective kind of in thinking about managing the landscape is if a crown fire is approaching us, how to, to bring that down to the ground and don't let it travel to structures. Uh, so how does your home get ignited in a wildfire? There's kind of three main scenarios. One is flying embers and brands that kind of travel well in advance of uh, the fire itself. And this has been kind of the most widespread occurrence and so you see in the image on the upper left, it's the roof and the kind of the bottom of the building where it meets the landscape that are really vulnerable to flying embers. And then there's radiated heat, which is the diagram on the right, upper right. And that's the one that, that's the situation where it gets so hot, maybe if you have older windows with untempered glass that it might actually blow out your windows. It also can go into to vents. So looking at your vents around the building, making sure they're small and screened and well-maintained. 
Um, there's direct contact by flame. And then the lower right just kind of basically says if you, if you have a wood roof and less than 30 feet of vegetation, you probably have more or less a 50% chance of emerging unscathed from a fire in your home. Um, but if you have a fire resistant roof and 100 feet of clearance, you really have a much, much better per percentage of chance. So, so that's kind of where we're trying to get everyone. And real briefly, so the issue with roofs and gutters is that um, especially if you have trees around your home and overhanging your home, you tend to get debris uh, both in the seams, kind of where the roof is, is kind of changing direction, you can see, and also in the gutters. So it's really important to maintain those clean and to have gutter screens. Uh, decks are also a serious issue, and that's actually part of your landscape element and how that first five feet as you come out of the house. So again, it's kind of where the, the building and the deck meet and embers tend to kind of gather in that juncture. And so there's some, some techniques like the flashings shown here um, between the deck and the building and some other techniques that can help prevent um, if your deck catches fire from your home catching fire. Another issue with decks is you get embers underneath. Either they come up underneath or they fall through the spacing between the decking boards. And, and so you want to enclose the deck with skirting. And always, as with any part of a building, you want to allow moisture to exit so you don't have mold or other issues. Another really serious issue, which I've seen a lot in um, our local and areas working kind of after the Tubbs fire and the fires in Knapp County as well, is fencing. Um, it's kind of something that, that's a little hard for people to think differently around because we're so used to privacy fencing giving us privacy, which everyone really values. Um, uh, but this typical privacy fence in the upper left is also kind of problematic because it has that vertical horizontal juncture where the fire can sit on those horizontal units against, uh, <clears throat> against the, the vertical planks and it also can catch at the base. Um, and so one of the, if you're keen on your privacy fence, one of the major things you could do is the image on the right, which is to have a non-combustible fence that actually connects to your home. So uh, some kind of a wrought iron fence or some kind of decorative metal fence, it's really gonna help there because that five feet away from the home is really critical. You can also look at uh, low fuel fencing. So like a, any kind of welded wire mesh, you can see that the, the amount of wood is significantly less. Uh, and also with this fence, you can see at the base of it, that's where debris accumulates. So anywhere you're seeing debris accumulating against a wood structure, uh, those are the kinds of things you're gonna wanna maintain clean in your landscape. I'm not gonna spend any time on this, but the FireSafe Marin has an excellent series of fact sheets and you can download those on their, on their website and they'll kind of run through all those elements, decks, roofing, vents, all that fun stuff. Um, give you updated information. So <clears throat> here we are kind of looking at a diagram. This is the way maybe for the last 30 years people have been looking at um, managing zones in the landscape. So the red zone immediately around the house is this first zero to five feet. That's the non-combustible zone, which is the most critical zone. And then the orange line out from that is the intermediate zone, which is the first 30 feet. And then <clears throat> extending out from there, and, and Damien's gonna talk quite a bit more about this zone, is the 30 to 100 foot zone. So you can see the vegetation is getting increasingly denser as you move away from <clears throat> the house. And the trees are generally, no, the, none of the trees are inside of that five foot zone. And they're all kind of isolated in clusters and the shrubs are kind of isolated in clusters. So you kind of want islands of trees and shrubs as it were. Um, so how do you get to a clean and green man, uh, maintained landscape? So the one on the left is, you know, uh, how a lot of our landscapes look, things are a little dense. If it's an older home, you might have foundation shrubs all around the home. You might have trees very close to your home. So it's really kind of an editing process, how you move from the <clears throat> image on the left to the one on the right. So you're gonna make some decisions so that you don't have shrubs up underneath your trees, that you're pruning your tree away from your chimney and your roof, and you're starting to separate those fuels. Uh, this diagram, it, the plant diagram, is kind of illustrating some of the similar things as kind of these islands of shrubs, and shrubs are really a key component to maintain in your fire safer landscape. 
And the reason why is that is the image on the bottom, which illustrates what's called a, a fire ladder, a fuel ladder, where the what you really want to avoid is the fuel getting up into the crowns of your trees. And the way it does that is by climbing up into the tree limbs with shrubs by and large. So you want to pull your shrubs away from your tree canopies. Uh, so this is kind of another illustration of how you can think three-dimensionally about the, the distancing between your trees and your shrubs. Um, so so zeroing, zeroing in on this five-foot zone guidelines, we want it to be non-combustible. So that means everything in that zone, from, from brooms outside your front door to your, your mats and um, you know, any kind of firewood containers or anything like that, you don't want any of that in that five-foot zone. And generally speaking, it's nice to have more of a medium water use irrigation zone against the building. So you have really well-watered plants against your building that are more um, really watery plants like irises and coral bells and succulents, things that are really not going to burn. And then are also easy to keep clean, the image of the kind of the debris against the fence. And so you don't want anything that debris can hide behind against your foundation. So you're all, for that reason also, you're going to tend to use gravel mulches, especially if you're in a high fire area. You can also use composted wood chips. So they need to be really small, kind of well-aged uh, wood mulch, not big chunky bits. You can also use paving in that five foot zone. And um, that's what it looks like. So this is an image of um, the, uh, <clears throat> the template designs that we did for the Sonoma County Water Agency and in collaboration with the city of Santa Rosa. And um, see if I can get my annotation thing here. Maybe I'll just go with a mouse, see if that works. Um, oopsie, not working. Right. Oopsie, sorry. Um, well, I'll just run through the numbers. Um, so, so what this landscape does is kind of gives you a, a couple of different design ideas. So this is a contemporary design of a landscape. So it's tends to be more linear forms, um, more simple, stripped down, modern, clean lines. And, and you can see how this kind of design is developing this really clean five foot zone away from the house. Um, so that's really illustrated in, um, in the layout here. And we also have kind of very sustainable elements that are featured in these designs like lawn alternatives that are lower water use, and we're using decorative gravel and, and succulents in the driveway to capture some of the stormwater off the driveway. And this is a 3D image of, of that landscape. And um, so you can see this really low plants in general against the building and the trees are pulled out so that you can maintain them away from the building. In, in this image, we don't have the gravel mulch right against the home, so that would be an improvement you would make. We also have the wood fencing connecting to the home, so those are two things that, that would need to change to make this a fire safer landscape. But it gives you a sense of what the landscape might look like configured three-dimensionally when you're starting to reduce the number of, of shrubs, especially right around the building, and, um, and, and widely separate your trees. And, and so as the trees mature, you're, you're planning for the trees to mature so you don't have to prune them heavily to stay away from your building. And here's some images of what these landscapes might look like in a contemporary style. You'd have um, stepping stones with gravel, you have fairly well separated plants. There's a rainwater feature there, which also becomes kind of a fire safer component. It gives you some discontinuity between your plants and your fuels in your landscape. And it also provides, you're capturing rainwater that waters your plants. So you have you know, plants that are having more moisture provided by uh, rainfall longer in the year. So you're both using less irrigation and having, a, um, again, this kind of cleaner, greener landscape. And here's an image of what what it might look like next to your home if you're using gravel mulches. In this image, you probably would take away the vine that's against the house. Um, 
But the kangaroo paws and the sedge grass there are reasonably fire safer. And if you could also go further lower with succulents and um, things that are even more fire, um, you know, more fire resistant, less combustible. But you can see how it starts to transform what's happening right around your building. It also becomes a little easier to maintain your building um, when you have these kinds of landscapes. And similarly, your backyard might look like this. And it's, it's also showing that you have these paved spaces adjacent to your home that are, are defensible spaces as well. Um, and they are spaces where you fire personnel could also uh, protect your home. Um, and in this image, you can see the, the swing way in the back is at some distance from the home. So that's also one of the combustible things that you'll want to have 30 feet from your home, ideally. And here's a different type of image that you could look at that would also be a fire safer landscape. It's just succulents and smaller trees. And the, uh, the Corten retaining walls also perform a fire safety function, <clears throat> kind of separate one level of fuel from the other. This is another one of our, our template gardens that we did for the water agency. And this one is a, a native adaptive style, so it's using native plants and more natural forms and natural um, looking elements blending in with our Sonoma County environment. So we have some of the same features. We have native meadow grasses, we're showing um, stepping stones, we're disconnecting the driveway from the street landscape so all the water from the driveway isn't ending up in the street. So there's some things we're doing that are just as, are sustainability oriented. Um, but similarly, we're also creating defensible space front and back. And you can see immediately around the home are mostly smaller plants. And that's kind of the, the medium water use, more well watered plantings. So this is that landscape with, um, without the trees. And you probably can pick this out already, but the adjustments that we would probably make to make this more fire safer would be the fence again, how it connects to the house and also the vine on the fence. So it's really oftentimes a kind of a thoughtful subtraction or editing that you're gonna be doing in your landscape and then working with lower elements. <clears throat> so the trees again are pulled away from the home. So you're providing shade, but it's not overhanging your roof. And here's some images of what this landscape might look like. <clears throat> Smaller sub shrubs and ground covers, some gravel mulches and trees and shrubs at a distance from each other. And an example of what the rainwater features would look like. And some images of uh, plantings that we might choose for these kind of lower um, plants that are under two to three feet that would fill in our understory spaces between trees and shrubs. And this is hard to read, but something that's available on the Sonoma County um, is called the uh, Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership. Uh, our plant list, so this is the low water use plant list and there's a column uh, third from right that's fire safer. So you could look through these plant lists and determine um, which are good plant choices for you. Um, and there are certain types of plants that you're going to tend to want to avoid, which are uh, some conifers, particularly um, junipers and, and cypress, um, pines that aren't well adapted here. Uh, things like pompous grass and bamboo um, tend to be pretty high, high fuel loads. So there's a list of don'ts too, and those are available um, on a number of websites, which we'll share at the end. And this um, just kind of reminding that, that we wanna design landscapes that have multiple benefits. So we don't wanna just design with the lens of fire safety. Um, gardens are therapeutic for us. Uh, they provide uh, pollinator resources and groundwater recharge. So we really need to think of the fire safer components as part of an overall system of design that does a whole lot of work for us. Um, and all these needs are being met. So you kind of layer over all these different considerations to arrive at a landscape that's fully working and holistic. So here's some websites that are 
helpful on the most kind of basic firescaping level, uh, the FireSafe Marin one, the Sonoma Water Landscape Templates one, and the FireSafe Sonoma one. And you'll find a lot of local resources on those three websites. And then I want to thank Daily X, and I'm going to pass it over to Damien. Thank you, Anne. Um, let's see. Am I able to share? I think we okay. need to unshare. Well, for some reason, I can't for the life of me see my mouse, <laughs> which is the problem <laughs> I've been having. I don't quite know what happened to it. Oh, okay. Right. Awesome. Okay. Fabulous. Uh, let's see, before I jump into my presentation, let me just say I worked with Anne on the template project and um, Anne is just really fantastic. I really enjoyed working with her and she is incredibly knowledgeable and I just really appreciated that presentation. Thank you, Anne. Let's see, so uh, here we are. So I'm going to talk about three categories of things during this presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, assessing risk. So some people are in a higher risk area than others. I think that's helpful for people to have a sense of in terms of assessing what, what it is that they need to do. I'm going to talk about design, especially from the 30 feet out um, aspect, which some people don't have. Some people have very small yards, and so it's less applicable for, for those people. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about maintenance and the truth is maintenance is probably one of the most important things that you can do and something that almost everybody can do immediately to reduce their fire risk. So today when I found out about the fire um, north of Guerneville, I had been meaning to do this anyway, but I actually stopped work and I got off my leaf blower and I went up on my roof and the roofs of four of my other neighbors and I blew the leaves off the roof. And that is a really meaningful action when you think about embers falling out of the sky onto people's houses. Um, getting the leaves off the roofs is, is really important. And there's a lot of other maintenance issues, a lot of the other maintenance things that we can do. And, and I will touch on those. And obviously, we'll be around for questions to answer more detailed uh, things about me. OK, so assessing your fire risk, I just want to start with some some basic resources that a lot of people may know and some other people may not know. And showed the bigger version of this map, but this is a Cal Fire risk map. The yellow area is moderate risk, the red area is high risk, I'm sorry, the orange area is high risk, and the red area is very high risk. It's good to know where you live um, in relationship to that. Now, this does not cover the urban areas. As you can see, Santa Rosa is completely white because it's not in the Cal Fire city. There are also wildland urban interface maps in Sonoma County, which you can use. Uh, you can get a sense of where the historical fires have been, especially if you've moved here more recently, you might not know where those are. And then we'll talk about uh, site-specific quality. So your particular property, how is it arranged and uh, what does that mean in terms of fire? So ideally we're looking for landscapes that are well tended and, and oftentimes watered. We say water, if you have plants that are really well adapted to drought conditions, those can be safe as well. Um, oftentimes plants uh, do better having irrigation, um, but um, you definitely want them to have really good maintenance. Uh, less good, we have the photo in the middle. A lot of people have uh, uncut dry grass, either that's lawn grass or that's wild grass in a larger property, and that can definitely be a hazard in terms of a flash fire. It doesn't necessarily have a lot of fuel, but it can burn really quickly. And then one of the worst situations is when you have poorly maintained shrubs right up against the house. And so you want to be careful of that uh, with that dense vegetation that can really catch fire and burn your structures. So talking about areas further out, so from 30 feet on beyond that, we want to have trees separated. If if possible, trees separated by twice their height, that's a pretty high bar um, to get, but uh, this is what that might look like. Uh, moderate risk on a property would be you have, you live underneath a canopy, but your garden underneath the canopy is well tended. It's uh, trimmed and irrigated and neat. 
Also medium risk, you might have uh, uh, shrubs mixed in with wild grass. It's potentially dangerous, but you don't have high fuel loads that you might have in a wooded area. And then the highest risk is really when you have uh, dense forest or dense shrubs, especially if it's poorly maintained and you have a lot of dead material. You might just take a moment and think about your particular property and your neighbor's property, let me add, and think about whether it fits into one of these categories or potentially some other categories. Another aspect of risk is the degree of slope. So the more slope your land is, the faster fire can spread and the higher flames will be. So if you have a flat area that's safer, that's good, um, 11 to 30 percent slope, you're getting into sort of the moderate risk range, and more than 30 uh, percent slope, it's uh, uh, potentially very high fire risk, and fire can spread fast, and the flames are a lot longer. Slope facing direction, Ann and I talked about this, maybe we'll talk a little bit more after um, the presentation. The basic idea is that the, the direction in which your property is facing affects how much moisture is on your property and how hot your property gets. If your property faces toward the southwest, you get midday sun and late afternoon sun when the day is hottest. <clears throat> that means it takes a lot of moisture out of your plants. Your plants tend to dry up more and um, uh, plants adapted to that area are, um, <clears throat> uh, are plants that, that do better in hotter, drier areas. If your property faces to the northeast, it's going to be a cooler property. You're going to get a little bit of morning sun, but you're not going to get as much sun throughout the rest of the day. So more moisture is going to be retained on your property in general. And so plants are going to be able to um, be better hydrated. If your property faces to the northwest or the southeast, it's their intermediate state. Okay, thinking a little bit larger scope. These are more rural property issues, but we've got a lot of rural land, a lot of rural people here in Sonoma County. I live in Sebastopol, more in the city, but immediately around me, there's, there's a lot of areas where people are, are out in the country. So thinking about the road that leads to your house, you have a two lane road that's wide and open. That's good, that's much safer in terms of fire. You have a single lane road, that's open, or do you have a single lane road where you have a lot of forest and vegetation crowding in on that road? There's a lot of harrowing stories of people driving out of the Tubbs fire or a lot of the other fires that we had in uh, 2017, and the road you live on really makes a difference. And so if you're thinking about that and you live in a more dangerous area, you need to take precautions earlier and you probably need to take more stringent precautions than um, somebody else might. Obviously, there's a risk in terms of you actually escaping during a fire, but there's also a risk that a lot of people don't think about, or some people don't think about, and that is whether firefighters are actually going to want to defend your property. If your property is down a long, winding, narrow road that is covered by trees, in many situations, firefighters are going to say, I'm not going to take that risk to my life and my colleagues' lives. There are other houses that we can defend that is less of risk to us and that um, that we may have a better chance of actually saving. The driveway leading to your house, again, this is also a little bit more of a rural issue than an urban issue, but if you have a wide open driveway, not that I like pavement, that's the reason that I put through the grass pave in there, it's a little more permeable, but um, if you have a wide open driveway, it's easier access to fire trucks, fire trucks are able to stage equipment and hoses and things like that, it's easier for them to turn around. As a fire truck driver, it's really dangerous going into a spot that you don't know whether or not you can turn around because sometimes firefighters need to hop in the truck and, and escape as quickly as possible to save their own lives. And so they wanna feel confident that they can do that on the property. So in the middle picture, we see a narrow driveway with vegetation crowding it, that's not so great. And then on the right is a photo of a house that doesn't have any driveway access. Um, not a very typical scenario, but there's definitely rural properties where people park and they may walk 100 feet or so in order to get to their house. And so that might be fine carrying the groceries, but when you have people trying to fight a fire on your structure itself, it's inconvenient for them. 
and you want to make it as convenient as possible. Okay, so that was the risk um, area. Now we're going to talk a little bit about designing for what I'm going to call the fuel break zone. So this is an area where if you have a fire approaching your house, when it hits the zone 30 to 100 feet out, you want the fire to be able to stop in that zone before it gets to your property. Now, this doesn't really directly affect the embers question. When, um, when Ann was talking earlier, she talked about three possible ways that a house can catch on fire, uh, from embers, from radiant heat, or directly from flame. In this situation, we're talking about really reducing the risk from, um, from direct flame and also potentially some radiant heat because we keep that radiant heat further away. So in, in theory, this landscape could stop a ground fire, and this area can be irrigated or not. Once you get far enough away from the house, it can be expensive and difficult to run that much irrigation. And so just be aware, if you have more irrigation, that tends to be better in terms of fire prevention. If you don't have irrigation, you need to be more careful about the plants that you select so that they're really low water plants. There's a lot of medium water plants that are really great for um, stopping fires, and we tend to cluster those right around the house. In this middle area, um, oftentimes it's really better to have drought tolerant plants. So here are some categories to be thinking about in terms of selecting plants for that zone. You generally want low growing plants, so 18 inches or under for the most part are really beneficial. We want low water plants. We can't say all natives are low water plants because there's actually even some high water, but there's a number of medium water, but natives tend to be lower water. Mediterranean plants also tend to be lower water, but again, not guaranteed to be lower water. And then you also want plants that are really tough. So plants that can deal with neglect because to be blunt, the further away from your house it is, the less people are likely to take care of it. That's just kind of the reality. So you want to have plants that can take care of themselves in large part and that can compete well with weeds. Because oftentimes weeds can grow up, will die back, and then become a fire hazard themselves. You want something that's really going to, to compete well and uh, that doesn't need a lot of babysitting. Uh, vertical spacing in the fire break zone. So it depends. I want to say something a little bit about the numbers here. People throw out a lot of numbers in terms of your plant spacing and heights and shrub distances and all that kind of thing. To be honest, this is somewhat subjective. The larger your spaces are, the more it'll protect from fire, but there's no hard and fast rule that if you paint 10 feet or you paint six feet, you know, you're, you're guaranteed safety. So anyway, in certain guidelines it says, prune your trees up six feet from the ground if you have more or less bare ground. Uh, if you have shrubs under your trees, ideally you want three times the height of the shrub until you hit the first branches of a tree. So you've got to have a pretty tall tree in order to do that. And when you're on a slope, those distances increase. And if you're on a steep slope, those distances increase considerably. Horizontal spacing, you want tree canopies 10 feet apart from each other. You want more if that's possible. Again, numbers are subjective. Uh, shrubs, we talk about having shrubs um, two times their height apart from each other. So if you have three foot tall shrubs, you want to have six feet between them. You can also do your shrubs in clusters, or you can do a couple of trees in clusters. Um, it's a little bit like social distancing for plants um, to help keep everybody safe. Again, on steeper slopes, you need to have more horizontal spacing, up to triple the spacing if you're on a very steep slope. Okay, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about maintenance. And to be honest, maintenance is probably the most important thing that you can take away from this presentation. And I'm, I'm gonna to touch on things, but I'm available to answer a lot more questions about maintenance. I've done landscape maintenance, and so I have some pretty deep knowledge in that and be happy to share that with you. But maintenance is something that you can do tomorrow, you know, if you feel like a fire is coming to your house. And even if you have a pretty lousy design, maintaining it well makes a big difference in terms of your actual fire risk. And so it's something I really encourage people to, to go out and, and make happen as soon as they can. 
okay, not the first thing that people think of when they think of maintenance, but emergency access is really critical. You want to, in the middle of the night, when your power is off, you want to be able to get out of your house, grab whatever you need to grab, run to your vehicle, take off in your vehicle, and have firefighters arrive, be able to find your house, and be able to travel safely across your property. So you want to limb vegetation 10 feet up from any paths. Think about firefighters carrying big ladders um, up to your house. You want to make that as easy for them as possible. This also ties into design. You want to have paths that are wide enough and solid enough for emergency workers to be on there. Uh, you want to make sure that your paths are in good condition. You want to look at handrails. Are they in good shape? Do you have slick surfaces? If you live in the redwoods, do you have moss growing on your concrete paths? You need to clear that off. Um, is your concrete slick? Do you need to do something to, you know, to make that more rough? Um, are your paths wide enough? Four feet width on main paths leading up to the house is minimum, wider is better. And uh, Ann and I have all sorts of suggestions for how you can minimize concrete, which um, we would both, I think, encourage you to do. Okay, maintenance immediately around structures. It's actually similar further away from the structures, but we'll just start close to the structures. So remove leaves and clutter. As I say, I got on my roof this afternoon and with a leaf blower. Please be careful when you do that, by the way. We don't want people injuring themselves doing fire maintenance. Um, so leaves, that's pretty straightforward and obvious. A lot of other things are not so obvious. People lean stuff against their house. People stack wood against their house. People have piles of clothing against their house. They have, you know, wooden tools against the house. Look at that, especially that five-foot space around the house, but also the 30-foot space around the house. Think, what here could burn? Or what can make it really difficult for me to remove leaves and other debris from the house? So maybe you have a metal structure, but that metal structure is trapping the leaves close to the house. Okay, prune or remove dangerous plants. So dead, dying, diseased, or flammable plants. And talked a little bit about junipers. Junipers are very problematic. They're low water, so people planted them a lot, especially in the 70s, but uh, they're, they're very dangerous when it comes to fire. Generally, in terms of maintenance on plants, if something is dead, feel free to prune it at any time of the year, especially if it's fire season. Um, that's almost universally true around human habitat. You know, when you get really out deep into the woods, ecologically, it's a little more complex than that. But it improves aesthetic, it improves fire safety, so if it's dead, take it out. If it's dying, plants have a certain lifespan, and so after a certain time, they start dying back. It may be time to just remove that lavender plant and put in a new fresh one that's going to be less of a fire. And then irrigate plants. You want to make sure that plants have adequate irrigation so that they have more moisture in them so that they can um, not ignite during a fire. Drip irrigation is an outstanding way of doing this, that. This is an inline drip emitter, which we use a lot of. I highly recommend inline drip irrigation. Daily Ask knows all about drip irrigation. They lead classes on it. I design it all the time. I'm happy to answer questions. I particularly like the inline drip irrigation because the buttons don't pop off. You don't have the tiny little quarter inch tubes that are popping off and, and really wasting water. So uh, I think inline is a really, really excellent way to go in terms of doing the drip irrigation. Uh, oh, where are we? Oh, and I think that is where I stopped when I went to go blow the, blow the leaves off my roof. Um, I want to add a couple of things um, in terms of resources. So this is a really outstanding book. And Daily Acts, I'm sure, will put this on a list when we are um, following up with emails. Firescaping by Douglas Kent. He is probably, I don't know, possibly the leading person in the state of California on landscaping and wildfire. What I really love about this book is it makes it easy to find the most important information you have. Chapters are very short, there's lots of diagrams, it's easy for anybody to understand. You can just turn to whatever you want and read five pages and get the knowledge. You don't have to read it cover to cover. It is 
so worth, it's worth 10 times what, whatever you pay for it. Um, the next thing that I want to recommend is this book. I actually recommend this book more than any other book you can find. I recommend a lot of books. Uh, Printing and Training, American Horticultural Society. Um, a lot of people don't know where to start with pruning. This is, it's a bit of a thick book, but it's cool because it goes species by species and actually because you prune an apple tree differently from how you prune a lavender plant. And this starts out very simple and generic and tells you how to properly prune things so that you're not just turning your shrubs into footballs and baseballs, which I see a lot. Um, it, it really shows how to keep your plants healthy and beautiful. And if you have fruit trees and things like that, it shows you how to produce lots of fruit from those fruit trees because you can prune an apple tree to be really beautiful, but that actually might not produce a lot of apples if you don't prune it properly. So very cool book. And um, thank you, Daily Act. Thank you, Anne. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Damien. Uh, and thank you, Anne. Great presentation. So much wonderful information. Um, before we jump into taking questions from the audience, um, just a little bit of housekeeping to go over. I promise I won't talk at you for long. Um, I just wanted to share with everybody a campaign that we're running at Daily Acts uh, for the rest of the year called the Be the Change campaign that is all about uh, compiling the, the power of all of our individual daily actions to sort of steer the world toward the vision of where we want it to be. And uh, so we have four buckets of actions that you can take. Each category has anywhere from five to 10 actions that you can register, uh, whether you're growing a garden, building civic engagement, so like voting or uh, writing representatives, saving resources, and practicing self-care. We keep track of the actions to help build this narrative and tell the story that not only is our community ready for transformative change, but we're already making it happen. So if you follow that link uh, on the screen, and again, we'll send that in the follow-up email, there's a lot more information. You can sign up and register your actions. And when you register actions, we will um, share resources with you to, to help you make those a reality. Uh, we also have some, some discount codes and things like that, like 10% a, a off for blue barrel rainwater harvesting systems if you sign up to save resources. So lots of cool stuff there. I uh, definitely encourage you to check it out. Um, and then we just have some really excellent upcoming events, uh, which again can be found on our website here. There's a link down at the bottom. Um, and last thing I'll mention just before we, we'll leave this upcoming event slide up so you can check it out while we're going over. Um, last thing I'll mention is that during the month of August, Daily Axe has a 100% matching donor. So any gift that you make to our organization to help make programs like this not only happen, but happen for free to you uh, will be doubled. So we really appreciate um, any contributions you can make and we'll have a, a donation link up uh, as later as well if you feel so inclined. So with that, um, we, let's, uh, let's move over to taking questions from the audience. So I know we had one in the Q&A already here. It looks like Anne already answered it. Um, but anyone who has a question for Anne or Damien, um, Anything on this topic, feel free to put it up in the Q&A or in the chat window. And uh, no need to be shy. In the meantime, I'll just read the response here for that first question. So Mimi asked, are you how are you defining fire safer from a plant perspective? And Anne's response was that plants with volatile oils without small leaves like needles, you know, things like rosemary, plants without twiggy branches that tend to dry out, harder wood and larger leaves are good as well as plants that hold a lot of moisture in their leaves. Um, and we'll share these lists for, for uh, good fire safer plants. Okay, so we have another question here. I live in a more rural area outside Sebastopol. I have mature cypress trees right up next to my house. Should I take them down? And it's funny, this is something that 
our, we were talking about before the webinar. So whichever one of you would like to take the lead on that. Well, uh, let me jump in. So it's really difficult to say without being on a property what you should do and what your other values are and um, in all those sorts of things. So let me just say that if you have cypress trees that are right up against your house, that's a really big risk. And at a minimum, I would say um, it's important to make sure that the tree is well trimmed back from your house. If you can get a 10 foot distance on that, uh, that would be a really good place to start. Um, it depends in part on how well hydrated that tree is. And so if that tree is planted around a lawn that gets a lot of uh, water from the sprinkler, that's a definite improvement and might make them safer. It depends how old that tree is and how large that tree is. I would say removing that tree is definitely a possibility and something that would be good to consider. Anne, do you want to add anything to that? I was going to add, I mean, other things, if you were hesitant to, to remove the trees, you could, you could remove, say, it sounds like maybe you had a line of cypresses, maybe remove every other and start to separate them out a little bit. And then the other part would be to, um, Damien mentioned, pruning them 10 feet away from the house, but you also want to look at the litter on the ground because that could also convey fire to your house. So I, you could, you know, keep them really clean and also keep the ground plane really clean. You could also say mulch with pea gravel or something like that. You'd have to yeah, blow right. it, you know, to keep the needles from, from building up there. But that's one of the reasons why certain plants are, they're just harder to maintain in a fire safer manner. It doesn't mean that you can't, it just means they need a lot more attention. And, and cypresses get planted a lot as evergreen screens, and so people really appreciate that in terms of screening out their neighbors or screening from view. Um, and so oftentimes there's a, there's a purpose that they're planted there, and so if you take it out, you have to realize that you may be missing that, and so you have to think about you know, what it might replace that to. Let's see, Damien, how do we work with permaculture food forest concepts in these fire safe too? Um, thanks for that question, Tom. Well, it's interesting that you ask that because I'm working with a client right now who's in a moderate fire risk area. Uh, her property's sloping and she's in the Cal Fire yellow zone. And I have done some things to try to um, make the property safer. So first of all, I put succulents right up around the house because um, she wanted to have some succulents. And then I actually did a food forest area, excuse me, I did a food forest area. Hold on. Can people still hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Um, that was an incoming call and my computer gets screwed up when I have incoming calls. Um, food for So I just did a product um, design for these people where I did a food savanna. So I had fruit trees that were spaced out from each other. And then I had very low growing nitrogen fixing shrubs. So we're getting sort of that nitrogen in the soil. And I also had low growing insectary plants to bring in beneficial wasps and predatory insects to help feed on aphids and scale and things along those lines. And so I basically designed the architecture like you would do um, a lot of fire safer landscapes where you have larger trees that are producing your food and then other companion trees that are, that are specifically designed to be really low and really um, uh, fire resistant. All right, it looks like we maybe have some questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah, we've got a few here. So um, I'm just gonna go in kind of a random order here. We've got a question about bay trees. So John has removed quite a few bay trees on a steep slope. Still has a few more slightly further away from structures and is wondering whether he should just plan on blanket removing all of the remaining bays on the property. And then he's got a note here saying that the remaining bays are actually much further from the structures. I could take it. Dive at that. I, I think it's, it's certainly a sensitive issue, especially if you're managing native plants. Um, how do you arrive at a balance between making it fire safer and then not wholly transforming that into a different type of landscape? 
And bays are definitely one of those species that have volatile oil. So they are, they are not <laughs> a fire safer plant. Uh, so I think you're smart uh, to remove them well away from your house. I'm not sure you would need to remove them all. Um, so I think thinking about them, maybe if they're in your th 30 to 100 feet, then how do you disconnect them from other fuels around them? They are a little challenging in general, um, I think, in our landscape. And we probably need some bigger thinking about how to deal with bays, because uh, they tend to advance under the oak trees and introduce sudden oak death when they uh, overtop the oaks. So that would be something that I would really um, not allow to happen would be for young bay trees to establish under your oaks and, and overtop them because then they'll, the oak trees will die and you'll have that fuel problem. Um, so I think the, the bays need some active management, but they also are a key component of one of, you know, of a native ecosystem. So I would not remove them all. We've got two different questions um, about the pruning manual. So I'll just ask them both at once. We've got, uh, what year is the pruning and training book published? I don't know if you know that offhand, or if you want to flip the cover. And the other question is just that, uh, does the pruning book include Northern California native perennials? Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, so in terms of the date, this is an older version that I have because I've had it for a while. There is a new, and this is a hard cover, there's a new soft cover version that I think is, is updated and even better and um, even less expensive than this was. And I don't know when, maybe 2017, something like that for the new book. And does it have Northern California native perennials? If by perennials you mean herbaceous species, this is all woody plants, and so it, it, it only has woody plants. So they have Northern California native woody plants. Um, it has a lot of things that pertain to Northern California native woody plants. Yes, it's, it's going to be useful for them, definitely. I can add that I'm, I'm working on a maintenance manual for the water agency that's kind of a companion to the template drawings, and it's not going to have a lot of information on pruning, but it's going to have some basics, but it will talk about how you prune grasses and perennials and shrubs in general. So it's kind of a, a starter <laughs> for people, a starter manual for people who are getting familiar with these ideas. And hopefully we'll have it done uh, by the end of the year. And it will also have resources. But um, I think we're kind of starting to see the need for more kind of smaller resources books that are really directly addressing the kind of questions that we have right here tonight. Like, how do you manage these native ecosystems to be fire safer in a sensitive way? I want to add one thing about that in terms of maintenance. And I, Anne and I have both done a lot of work in terms of designing low water landscapes. And I think one of the things that we've seen is that native plantings and low water plantings, when you're getting away from lawn, it actually requires less time to do the maintenance, but it requires more knowledge. And so it can be a little intimidating to say like, well, how is this plant different from this plant? When do I prune it and all those sorts of things. Um, it, there's so much information available these days, like on the internet um, and project that she's working on and books that we have to recommend. So there's resources available, but um, it, it, it's helpful. It's helpful to have some additional knowledge so that you can really take good care of the plant. It looks like there's a, a something in the chat box too from Mimi Enright that says California native gardening, a month by month guide by Helen Hopper is a great resource for native plant maintenance. Great. I love all the, the resource sharing happening in the chat. Uh, scrolling back up and seeing one more of a comment, but maybe it's something that uh, sparks some thoughts from either or both of you. Carol says, uh, I'm in a neighborhood rebuilt after the Tubbs fire, and I see a lot of landscapes installed with trees and shrubs planted right next to homes. It seems some of the professional landscape installers are not always aware of fire safe design, and uh, that surprises her. So I don't know if that you know, sparks anything about any thoughts on that. Connor, where is that question? I'm trying to find that. So that in the chat, it uh, was asked at 724, so right above the oh, question. Okay. I just think that, that garden design is, is kind of, I mean, there has, a, there has a lot of traditions in it. You know, the, the tree in the front yard with the lawn and the foundation shrubs against the building, and the people are very attached to those. So it, it takes a while for 
new design ideas um, to take root and become um, visible enough in landscapes for people to kind of conceive of that as like a new normal, you know? And so I think that's kind of the conversation that we're having is realizing that our garden ideas, which are largely from all over the world in different parts of the United States, don't always fit that well in California. And so how do we come up with garden ideas, edible or native or ornamental or all of the above that really fit well in California and that meet our needs for lower water use and that are pollinator friendly, that are fire safer and you know, um, groundwater recharging, restoring soils. Like we need our gardens to do all this work for us. And one of the issues we have is, is in a way kind of getting our cultural adaptation moved around a little bit. So these kinds of things make more sense to everybody and are just part of our everyday experience of our landscapes. I'd like to take that and expand it even beyond the landscape. So if you go to say Coffee Park and you look at the rebuild efforts, I, I think it's true. I think a lot of landscape designers are not knowledgeable about being fire safer or they're learning, you know, they're, they're new at it. And so they're, they're, they're in the process. I think there's a lot of other design elements, you know, like fences and, and there's probably things in the construction of the house. I'm less knowledgeable in those areas. We are going through a radical change in so many different categories. Like I think about, we're gray water experts at permaculture artisans and so many clients in the repo that say, hey, can you talk to my plumber about gray water? And either the plumber is resistant and like doesn't want to do it because it's new or they're like, hey, I need some help with this thing because my client really wants it, but I don't know the first thing about gray water. So it takes time to make that transformation. You as somebody connected to daily acts may be knowledgeable about things that your professional is not knowledgeable about. And I put a, you know, um, I did a rebuild on my house a couple of years ago and I had a contractor come in and I worked with a contractor and there were all these things that I wanted and the contractor was like, oh, well, I've never done that before and I don't know how that works and I'm going to have to research that. And so you've got to advocate for the things that are important for you and contact other professionals and other people who can intervene and, and help out. And a lot of those conversations that we had with plumbers, um, that's like how we change the industry. You know, we educate people, they do it for the first time, like, oh, that wasn't so bad. I can handle that. And then the next time somebody asks them about gray water, then they're going to feel more comfortable doing that. Thank you both. Uh, we've got a couple more questions in the Q&A window. So Donna is asking, what native grasses might be better to start introducing into pastures or sheep graze? Uh, she's seeded dry land pasture mix in the past couple of years. Ooh, that's a tricky question. I'm not totally, I mean, it's a great question, but I don't feel totally versed in which of the native grasses are most preferred by grazers. Um, my guess is you're gonna look at more of the persistent perennials like um, June grass, cholaria, the fescues, um, some extent purple needle grass, uh, meadow barley um, is probably pretty tasty. Um, and the, and the grasses that are going to do well on your site are going to really relate to aspect, which was something slope aspect that Damien talked about. So you're going to have more success if you have a north or east facing slope, getting native grasses established and kind of getting them to dominate the annual European weeds than you will on a south or west slope where you have such heavy sun and drought pressure. Um, a person who's a, a really great local expert on native grasses and grazing is Richard King, who's a specialist in Petaluma on uh, holistic grazing systems. Um, and I, I have done a course with him and it's super fun. Um, anyway, I, I go for it. <laughs> I think there's lots of resources out there and um, be happy to chat more offline if, if you want to. That, that was a really great answer. I just want to add one little piece that um, in addition to thinking about what kinds of grasses you're seeding, you may already be thinking about this, but also thinking about how the sheep graze and whether you're really concentrating them to try to knock down some of the non-native grasses and then putting them on another pasture and seeding with some native seeds so that those native seeds have um, more open ground to uh, sprout and come up waiting for the sheep to come back later. 
I should also add there's one other kind of sensitivity to be aware of, which is um, when you're working with native plants and particularly next to a, a wildland area is try not to introduce seed that's from a different genotype or a different area of the state. So, um, you know, bringing in pine bluegrass or something that's from the southern part of uh, the Central Valley would have different adaptations than our local pine bluegrass. And so um, you'll find that there's reputable uh, sand, uh, seed purveyors and native plant purveyors that really pay attention to sourcing native, native ecotypes. And that becomes more important if you're near a preserve where we're trying to uh, preserve native plants with their local um, genetic adaptations. And you can imagine how genetic adaptations are pretty important right now with, with climate change. Um, so anyway, that's, that's another note. So, so for example, hedgerow farms in Winters, California lists all the different ecotypes that are available for different types of grasses where um, Labalisters, which is a local firm, won't necessarily have as many listings of what is a local seed, and so their seed might be coming from Idaho or so, somewhere else like that. So that's something to be to pay attention to um, to preserve native um, genetic diversity. Okay, here's a question from Ali: How often and for how long is it good to water native shrubs? to keep them well hydrated, assuming they're sun loving and well established, weekly or monthly for 30 minutes or one hour or something else. What do you think about low volume sprinklers? Uh, yeah, so it depends. So let's see how thoroughly I can answer this. So first of all, some, um, let's see, native shrubs that are well hydrated, so sun loving and well established. Um, so first of all, you want to look at whether these shrubs are medium water, low water, or very low water plants. There's some native plants that you actually probably don't want to water at all because they're really well adapted to drought. Like I think of something like flannel bush. If you overwater flannel bush, you'll kill your flannel bush. Um, so you just have to be aware of just how much water something needs. Uh, assuming that it's something that does need water, which I would say most of our native plants do well with getting some irrigation. If it's well established weekly or monthly for shrubs, weekly or biweekly is probably a pretty good cycle, depending on what it's used to. So if it's used to getting water every day and suddenly you water it once a week, it might have some adjustment issues. So be aware of what kind of water it's gotten so far. And if you want to change it, change it somewhat gradually. Um, monthly could be fine if it's a really tough um, uh, plant that's not used to a lot of water and you just want to give it some supplemental water, that could be really appropriate. How long to water it for? One of the things I like to say to people is plants don't read books. So your book might tell you one thing, but you really got to listen to what your plant tells you. And um, you got to see what it's doing. So is it dying back? Is it turning yellow? Is it turning brown? And if you're seeing problems, stick your finger in the ground and see if the ground is wet down four inches or so. And if it's turning brown and it's dry, then you probably need to give it some more water. And if it's turning brown and it's really soaking wet, then you probably need to give it less water. And that sort of sounds like a simplistic answer, but a lot of people don't take the time to actually go into the soil and see what the soil is doing and look at their plants and see, you know, what their plants are actually doing. Um, in terms of the length of time, you want to make sure that there's enough water that it's really penetrating into the ground. And if you have like micro, uh, micro sprayers, you get a very different amount of water than if you have inline drip irrigation. And so micro sprayers, you would keep on for a much shorter period of time or something like a bubbler. Um, then you would drip irrigation. So you might have a spiral inline drip irrigation and you might leave that running for three hours if, if that's the appropriate amount for your plant. So it depends a lot on exactly how much, how many gallons of water you're depositing there. And also in the soil and how much water that soil can hold if it's sandy or if it's an adobe clay. I, I would just add, that's a great answer. Um, and I would just add, add two, two tips. One is most native plants don't want soil that's wet all the time because they're adapted to dry soil. So definitely let them dry out between waterings. And depending on what type of system you have, especially if you have those 
those little drip emitters that you, you know, you push onto the hose. When the installer, the landscape installer comes, they'll put those right next to the plant stem or collar. So literally like right there <laughs> on the plant. And what'll happen is if you leave them there, you'll overwater that plant collar, which is kind of a sensitive place for like um, soil fungal diseases and rot. So your drip ir irrigation system kind of needs to move away from the immediate plant stem to the outer edges of the roots as your plants mature. So you'll find that if you actually get out there and kind of move around your drip system a little bit um, and or move those emitters or the micro sprinklers that your plant might actually do better. And so, cause most plants don't like to have irrigation on the trunk. I wanna add one other little piece to that. Uh, it wasn't asked, but it's related. In general, please do not give our native oaks summer water. Once in a while, like during a drought, actually that's probably okay once every month or two. But in general, our native oaks are really sensitive to summer water and can kill them. And so if you have lots of plants under your native oaks, first of all, that might not be a good idea. And second of all, really try to avoid uh, watering as much as reasonable. I see Greg Plum um, with Sonoma Water also has posted the uh, recommendations for the city of Santa Rosa. They have a uh, uh, watering recommendations. And th there's somebody who knows a lot more than I do about <laughs> water your plants. Greg Plum is an amazing local resource. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Okay, we've got another question here. Um, any advice on how to prune a tree that touches a neighbor's house for no hours? Would it look weird if half the tree is removed versus should the whole tree be removed? How to prune the tree that touches the neighbor's house, but not ours. So I'm guessing that this tree is quite a bit closer to the neighbor's house um, and a little bit further away from yours. Um, touches the neighbor's house. Yeah, so it's, it's tricky without seeing a photograph or seeing some sort of satellite image or something like that. Um, so the first thing that I will say is, let's assume that you're going to prune the tree. If this is a somewhat mature tree, like let's say it's more than 10 years old, um, you generally don't want to prune off more than 25% of the leaves at any one time. Pruning off more than 25% of the leaves is going to be damaging and dangerous for most trees. There's a few exceptions, which you can read about in the book. Um, but for the most part, you, um, you just want to be careful about the quantity that you are removing from a tree because it can be really stressful for that tree. Um, also be aware that when you prune stuff, you can have uh, sort of um, expansive growth that can come from that pruning and doing proper pruning can limit that, but just be aware that you may have some bounce back there. Um, in general, I was just talking to two arborists on our property last week about pruning branches closer to the house and leaving branches further away from the house open. And somebody was asking them, well, isn't that a problem because you have these lop lopsided trees? And both of the arborists were very knowledgeable, said trees are constantly adapting to stresses. And trees build wood based on the exact weight that they experience at any moment. And so they will build branches and they will build trunks in order to compensate. Now, if you cut off half of a tree, it's challenging to compensate you, in a short period of time. In a long period of time, they'll be fine. But again, try to take it easy and not prune too much at once. And the tree will do okay in terms of structure. Aesthetically, you know, I can't answer it again without seeing a picture. Aesthetically, it could be a little weird. Got another question here, maybe a, a plant gilding question. Diane planted an orchard, 18 trees, various fruit, 10 to 12 feet apart. And she's looking for advice on what to plant around the trees, between them, and in the aisle. And do you want do you want to take that, or do you want me to take that? Um. Well. Why don't you go and I'll add on. Sure. 
Um, so this begs the question is what, it, what is it that you want? What, what do you want out of your system? So one assumption might be that you are here at a daily X talk and you're interested in permaculture and you want to do a food forest type system. If that's the case, the way I tend to design those systems is uh, I like to put in a lot of nitrogen fixing plants. Um, the theory is, and let me say, this is not a um, deeply tested uh, truism, although a lot of permaculturists would like to think that. But anyway, I like to put a lot of nitrogen fixing plants. You want to be careful in terms of the spacing. So you got to assess, like, do you have a high fire risk property? Do you have a low fire risk property? And you're going to make some decisions based on that. Um, but nitrogen fixing plants uh, can be helpful. Fruit trees tend to use more nitrogen than just say like a native oak tree or something like that. Um, I also am putting in insectary plants, not so much to attract bees, although that can be beneficial, but a lot of small flowered plants like yarrow or uh, plants in the carrot family to bring in predatory wasps and other um, insects that will come in and eat your aphids and, and things along those lines. You can also plant plants that in theory bring up nutrients from the subsoil uh, to the surface and um, provide more nutrients for your fruit trees. You can plant plants that uh, produce a lot of mulch that when you cut them down like comfrey and then you have mulch on the ground and so that is easy. So there's all these different categories that we can put into a food forest as well as other edible plants. I actually have some nitrogen fixing um, berry plants uh, in the Eleagnus genus that I like to plant and um, those can be tasty and add to nutrients to the system as a whole. I think that answered the general gist of what you may possibly be asking. Anne? Uh, well, I'm kind of a native plant nut, so I'd be trying to get native plants in the mix there. Uh, he mentioned a couple, you know, the yarrow and the carrot family. Um, there's a um, uh, carrot family or umbel family members like, um, oh God. It's basically umbel, like that, um, I'm thinking of yampa. For yogunum, What's that? A native areogonum. Yep, areogonum is cool. Um, um kind of cow parsnip type things other uh, smaller ones um by the way uh ceanothus is a you can get low growing native ceanothus which are nitrogen fixers and so that's something that i used in that um food savanna system that i just designed yeah so anyway that i kind of my my mantra is more try and have over 50 percent natives in your garden and so you're you know, your food resources are within that and then you're mixing and so you're kind of trying to overall uh, continue an, a strong amount of biodiversity on your site. And um, we talk a lot about honeybees and pollinators, but there's hundreds of native bees of all different types. Um, so it's actually really important to, to just always activate your local insect populations and have a, a diverse setting because you'll actually reduce your d disease pressures by doing so. So a lot of our agricultural systems are really based from other regions. So I kind of try to be creative and think about new associations and combinations. Yeah, and, and minus your main fruit trees, having all of the companion plants or, or having a lot of the companion plants be native is very doable. Um, it's, it's it, obviously it limits your palate, but it's, but it's really, um, really possible. And one thing to think about is that native plants tend to have a lot more ecological connections. So you might have one um, carrot family, you know, sulfur flower or something like that, that may have 27 different insects that come and visit it and connect it with it in some way. Whereas you might have a European variety that's similar and that might only be visited by three different insects. So that's pretty cool in terms of building a robust ecosystem in your landscape. I, w I was trying to think of Angelica. That's another Angelica, yeah. that you could use. Yeah. Excellent. Do we have any more questions before we start wrapping things up or any uh, last minute considerations that have occurred to you, Damien and Amy? Okay. 
Uh, well, I was just going to add, I just encourage um, people to share information with your neighbors and have a, you know, conversations around gardening with your neighbors along these ideas, because really we're fire safer as communities. And so what we're seeing a lot is um, folks forming uh, fire safe councils and other organizations to begin to work together um, to address these types of issues on larger landscapes. Um, so. So, you know, it's important to be part of those conversations and they can be nice opportunities to connect with people in your neighborhoods. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to reiterate a theme that Anne brought up earlier, which I think is, it's not surprising for Daily Acts listeners, but I think it's really helpful for the conversation in the broader society dealing with fire. Uh, a lot of people think about fire safe, safer landscape as paved with gravel and mm -hmm. And was talking that landscapes have many, many benefits and gravel doesn't really cut it. And so it's really important to have examples of landscapes that are fire safer, that provide us with beauty and food and habitat and connection to our ecosystems um, that bring us joy, not just that are safer for, for fire. And it's really possible to do and we have some good examples of that. And uh, we really need to get that word out there. You know, there's a lot of fire chiefs who are very concerned about people's safety and, and structures. And, you know, they're not landscapers. They're not landscaper designers. So they don't necessarily know what options are out there. But it's our responsibility to engage in those conversations, to help to educate people, obviously to learn where we can learn from others, and really have rich, productive landscapes that are also um, protect us from the very real threat of wildfire that we have here. So that kind of tees up uh, really nicely this question from Leslie, uh, which is if either of you would want to touch on what some preferred mulches other than gravel or stone could be. Uh, definitely not that the gorilla hair mulch. <laughs> yeah. Definitely avoid gorilla hair. And do you want to start with that one? Uh, sure. I mean, most mo most of the research is pointing toward well composted um, wood chips or or straight up compost. Um, so something that's been aged. You know, that if you look at it, doesn't have a lot of bigger angular pieces. It has more rounder pieces and pieces that are starting to look more like soil. Um, so uh, that's you know that's a little bit of a challenge because that isn't always what we have available from our different vendors. And I think that's something that, that'll probably change moving forward. But, but, but I would err toward a compost, um, more of like a green waste compost, if you couldn't get a um, well mulched, um, well composted wood mulch. So go, go toward something that's starting to look more like soil and less like wood chips. Um, like the big wood chips that you see around a play structure, you don't want anything like that. Um, as a fire can just travel right through that, unfortunately. Um, I'd like to add one thing sort of on top of that conversation. I think oftentimes well-designed landscapes will have vegetation, fire safe, lower growing vegetation, but vegetation that's designed to cover the entire ground. And so there's not as much room to put down mulch or something along those lines. And um, having big spaces around stuff isn't, you know, always necessarily desirable. And so that's sort of another thing to think about is, are we really designing plans to take over our work? Like if we're applying mulch year after year after year, maybe we really need to think about how can we arrange the plants in such a way that we don't have to bring in all these outside resources continually. In the beginning, it's totally super helpful, but in the long run, it might be something that we can avoid in large part. Yeah, that's a good point. A lot of the template designs are actually designed so that you get m more plant coverage over time and there isn't a lot of spacing between plants, mostly because it creates a situation that you're going to have to be weeding in order to keep the fire safer landscape. And so um, in a lot of ways, it's better to plant something that's going to cover the ground that you know is pretty fire safe and you're maintaining it was usually a little more fun than, than weeding. Um, so, so that's a good, that's a good 
point, Damien, I think, is to try and get to more of a stable landscape with, with less wide expansions of mulch. All right, well, unless we have any last minute burning questions, uh, I think I can speak for everybody who's here tonight uh, when I say I so appreciate all of the insight and knowledge that the two of you shared with us. Um, I definitely learned a lot. I hope everyone else did too. So uh, lots of gratitude for you and for everyone who joined us tonight, taking the time out of their Tuesday night for this fire safe landscaping webinar. I uh, just want to make a quick shout out to Daily Act sponsors, um, without whom we wouldn't be able to pull off awesome programs like this one. Um, also a little shout out to my colleague Liz, who has been working uh, doing all of our tech support. <laughs> um, and so just, just a last, uh, last little plug again, we have some great events coming up. We have our Be the Change campaign. We're going to send you an email in the coming days once the recording of this webinar is processed and up on the internet uh, with a lot of these excellent resources that both Damien and, and uh, some of you actually put into the chat for all of us. Um, you can email me with any questions uh, or call our office line. Um, and again, we do have a 100% matching donor till August 31st. So if you appreciated this event, if you want to see more programs like it, just a reminder that uh, giving today before August 31st, that impact is doubled. And we so appreciate any help you can uh, pass along our way. So with that, um, just want to say good night, stay cool, stay safe. And uh, we hope to see you at some of our other upcoming events. Thanks again, Damien and Anne. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. You're the host, so. Oh, all right. I'm the host. I'm going to log out. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Bye.